Well, tonight we are in session 10 of our review of the book of Daniel, and we are going to plunge into Daniel chapter 9. And for many, many prophecy buffs, me included, this is probably one of the most pivotal chapters in the entire Bible if you're going to understand uh, end time prophecy. The last four verses of the chapter are the fabled 70 week prophecies. We'll go, th go through all of that. And so we are in chapter 9 of the book of Daniel. Now, just to give you a context here a little bit, you realize Daniel's 12 chapters, the first six are historical, where he's deported, he encounters Nebuchadnezzar and in, in, uh, interprets his dream, and his rivals, and he gets promoted as a result of that performance. His rivals get a chance to try to undo his three friends, the fiery furnace episode. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the world at that time, writes a chapter in the book in which he recounts his lesson in pride that God gave him. Very interesting uh, chapter. But then, of course, the fall of Babylon. We spent two sessions on that because Babylon is not only important historically from a biblical perspective point of view, but it's going to be one, I believe, one of the major prophetic milestones that's emerging on the horizon. So we spent two sessions on that. Then we get to the lion's den. Now we're in the Persian Empire period. And uh, you realize that the, the uh, chapters 2 through the end of 7 are not written in Hebrew, they're Aramaic, because those chapters focus on the Gentile world. Very unusual for the Bible to do that. It usually sees everything, past and future, through the lens of Israel. But this is a section that is so dear to us because it's very unabashedly focusing on the Gentile world. Now, after the first six chapters, we have six chapters that are a collection of the visions. They're, in a sense, appended at the end, which means they're not in chronological order, the chapters all as a, as a group. We have the Times of the Gentiles, which we reviewed, that's going to, and then we have the Ram and the Goat, that is the career of Alexander the Great as he defeats the Persians. And then we're in the chapter 9, the 70 weeks tonight. And next time we'll be, uh, after we finish the chapter 9, we'll be get that strange glimpse of the dark side, and then um, we'll see the silent years between the Testaments written in advance, and then we have the total wrap-up of all of history in the book of Daniel. Very exciting book, but again, it's not in chronological order. It, it, the, the, the chapters 7 and 8 occur between chapters 4 and 5, and chapter 9 occurs between chapters 5 and 6, because they're visions that were seen at that time. Looking at another way, we, when we got down into uh, Nebuchadnezzar's lesson in pride, it was, the next session would have been the Times of the Gentile vision that Daniel himself received and then the ram and the he-goat. Then Babylon falls in chapter 5, and we have this strange plot of the Magi trying to get even for Daniel being put in charge of them, this hereditary priesthood of Persia, and uh, that leads to the lion den incident. Seventy weeks would follow that. In other words, we're now in the Persian period as far as the chronology of it's concerned. And then 10, 11, and 12 follow, of course. So again, the uh, chapters 2 through 7 are in Aramaic, but we're now in the Hebrew again. Chapter 8 to the end is in Hebrew, meaning the focus of this is once again on Daniel and his people in contrast to the Gentile dominion. And uh, so 70 weeks is where we are now. Before we get into chapter 9, I think it's important for us to get another perspective, and that's when Jesus gave a confidential briefing on his second coming to his disciples. In fact, not to all of them, to four special ones. It's recorded in Matthew 24 and 25, Mark 13 and Luke 21. It's important enough that it's recorded in three Gospels. And we'll focus on Matthew's for a couple of reasons, not the least of which Matthew had a skill the others didn't. Anyone know what it is? Shorthand. He was a customs official. It was a job requirement that he take shorthand. And that was a skill prevalent in those days. And, uh, but in any case, we find that four disciples came to Jesus to ask about his return, the second coming. Peter, James, John, and Peter's brother Andrew. These four are specifically identified by Mark as being present. This happened to occur on the Mount of Olives, so some people call it the Olivet Discourse which is sort of irrelevant because it was a private briefing to these four guys. But it's so important that it is recounted in three Gospels, Matthew 24 and 25 in the lengthy version, Mark 13 and Luke 21 are essentially parallel passages. And uh, what's interesting is that in this briefing, Jesus specifically points them 
to Daniel chapter 9 as the key to end time prophecy. And that's one, that's one of the many reasons that we're focusing on this. And we'll draw our primary perspective from Matthew 24 and 25. In Matthew 24, verse 3, it says, As he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us three questions. When shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming? And of the end of the world? Three questions in effect. And uh, uh, he then gives them a two-chapter answer. To give you just a flavor of it, Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Underline that word deceive because he opens and closes this briefing to his disciples warning them not to be deceived. So this should lead you into a special study of how do you protect yourself from being deceived. There are all kinds of people spreading all kinds of perspectives. Uh, how do you tell which one's correct? By diligence, of course, and comparing scripture with scripture. And your ultimate refuge is always the whole counsel of God. A perspective should be consistent with the total package. Take heed that no man deceive you, he says, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in divers places. And all these are the beginning of sorrows. Many, many people view these issues as signs, except he really says these aren't signs. These are non-signs. This and that will happen, but the end is not yet. He is going to focus on some signs, some trigger points. Some, some, uh, these things are, in other words, generalities that are going to be uh, uh, on the horizon, and they will be increasing in frequency and intensity. The word sorrows there is actually birth pangs. You girls know what it's talking about here. They start slowly and increase in frequency, and they also increase in intensity. And that's exactly the characteristic of these things here. But the end is not yet, Jesus says. Then he gives you the key of it to watch for. He's not talking to you and me. He's talking to Jewish disciples. He says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth let him understand, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains, and he goes on. How many of you read that with me or heard those words just now? Can I see your hands? Any hands? Okay. Good. I played a dirty trick on you. Do you see what instruction you got? Whoso readeth, let him understand. See, this pa passage will turn out to be a little technical, but it's not intended for pastors or specialists. It's intended for you and me. Whosoever we have, let him understand. Jesus has done you a gigantic favor in these few verses, in verse 15. First of all, he saved you hours of boring library research. Who wrote the book of Daniel? Daniel, how do you know? Jesus said so. You know, the defense rests. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you know who wrote the book of Daniel. If you don't believe in Jesus Christ, you've got bigger problems than the authorship of the book of Daniel. Okay. He also identifies him as a prophet. But he does something even more. He points you to the, the very passage that we're, that's going to constitute the primary study of both tonight and the next session. And uh, we're going to discover later, we're going to take on, what is this abomination of desolation? You see that phrase there? That's a technical phrase. We know it, a lot about it because it happened specifically once before in history, and we'll examine that. It's the erection of an idol. An idol is always considered an abomination in the Bible, but the ultimate uh, abomination, the abomination that makes desolate, it's the extreme version of that, is erecting an idol, a pagan idol, in the Holy of Holies. And that happened back in 167 B.C., and and the results of what happened are celebrated. After three years, it led to a, a revolt. And after three years, they rededicated the temple from that uh, outrage. And they celebrate that to this day in Hanukkah. And we'll talk more about that when we get there. But I want, while I'm here, and I didn't want to miss the point, do you notice what Jesus says? When ye therefore shall what? See. 
See, the abomination of desolation occurs in the Holy of Holies. Who gets to go in the Holy of Holies? Anyone here been in one? <laughs> only the high, under normal way, only the high priest, only once a year, and after great ceremonial preparation at Yom Kippur. So the Holy of Holies is inside the holy place, which is inside the temple. How can you, assuming you're somebody in Judea, see this going in, going on? How do you see that? On CNN. <laughs> and I'm not being facetious. In other words, this is a major political event that happens inside, in, in the Holy of Holies, inside the holy place, inside the temple. That's how we know there will be a temple standing for this to happen. And how will you, if you're in Judea, that then the, the, uh, when you shall see this, then let them which be in Judea. It doesn't limit the people seeing it. It could be around the world. But when this happens, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Not New York or L.A. or wherever. Those who are in Judea. Why? You need to understand what's going on here. But this is a major trigger point. It's a prophecy. It will mean nothing to you until you go to that passage that Jesus is pointing them to in Daniel and understand the, co the context of all of this, which is what we're about. But when that happens, Jesus says, let them which be in Judea flee the mountains. And then he says, let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. If you've been in Israel, you know the houses that are on hillsides. They typically are. It's very hilly. It's the roof that is sort of the patio. It's the place they spend the cool of the evening on. Not the backyard. They're not that large, but it's on the roof. The roof is sort of like a, a fellowship place. You go downstairs to get to the bedrooms and all the rest of it, see? He that, let him that is on the housetop, typical social place, not come down to take anything out of his house. In other words, he's saying, you split and you split now. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. Because they're going to have a logistics problem. Because they've got to flee with that, head, that burden, that handicap. Get this last phrase. Pray that your flight be not in winter. Neither on the Sabbath day. Who is, he ta is he talking to Gentiles here? Keep that in mind. Because the whole study tonight is going to focus on Israel and Jews, not Gentiles. And you'll see why. It's a very important to understand. He is directing this to his disciples, which are Jewish, but it's obviously yet future. And yet he's still, his focus here is, most people don't fully recognize the Jewishness of Matthew 24. Because he goes on to say later, he says, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. He is quoting from Daniel 12. We'll look at that shortly. But Jesus himself labels not seven years, the last half of that seven-year period, as the Great Tribulation. He labels it right here, drawing from Daniel 12. And we'll get into that shortly. But then he makes another statement. He says, And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. That's a technology statement again. We've already had an allusion here to worldwide television. We also have here an allusion to advanced weapons. If, I, if you read verse 22 when we, during the Civil War, it wouldn't mean much to you. You can't imagine the world wiping itself out with muskets and bayonets. But today, the nuclear cloud hangs over every geopolitical decision on the planet Earth. Except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. That's a technology statement, interesting enough. Well, that's, just, that's the context. I want to start in the New Testament springboard from there because we're going to follow his advice here and go into Daniel chapter 9, which is the illusion that he was making. And uh, now a couple of things, that another fact that most of you are familiar with, but I want to emphasize it because it's going to be of profound significance to you when you get to verse 25 of Daniel 9. The original Hebrew text is typically, typically called the Vorlaga. It was com the Old Testament. We're talking about Old Testament here. The Tanakh, as the Jews would call it. That was really assembled, we understand, in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah. You know, uh, four or five centuries, several centuries before the Gospel period. When you get to the third century before Christ, if you were a Jew, you probably did not know much Hebrew. You spoke Greek. Greek was the enforced 
in language under Alexander the Great and following. Latin became the official language of the, of the Roman Empire, but even the Roman Empire took a while to, it was, the, it was the official language, everybody spoke Greek, Greek was the language. If you were Jewish, that was frustrating. You used Hebrew the way a Catholic uses Latin. You might know some Hebrew for ceremonial reasons, certain prayers and things, but it wasn't necessarily a comfortable language to you. And for that reason, the Jewish community aspired to having their scriptures translated into Greek, the common and very precise language of the day. So under, Ptol under Ptolemy Philadelphus II, starting about 285 B.C. and finishing at 270 B.C., he commissioned 70 top scholars, some say 72. Some say there were uh, uh, six from each of the 12 tribes. There's all kinds of legends about this, but the, the, the word 70, the word Septuagint is just a fancy word for 70. Their work product, that 15-year work product, is known as the Septuagint translation. The point I want you to keep in mind is that was in black and white three centuries before Christ's ministry. It, the, the Greek version, the Septuagint version of the Old Testament was the Christian's Bible during the New Testament period. Most of your New Testament quotes from the Old are from the Septuagint, the Greek, not the Hebrew. So I just want to, the point, what I'm, the reason I want to emphasize this, setting aside who wrote Daniel and under what circumstances, for our purposes tonight, it doesn't matter. It was in black and white 300 years before Christ makes references here. And you need to understand that before some surprising discoveries here. And understand the Septuagint, you need to understand the importance of the Septuagint uh, translation. The Masoretic text, the Hebrew text that we have in the Old Testament, was actually derived from, well, it, the, from the Council of Yomnia in uh, 90 AD, but most of it as we have it today is really about 9th century. So it came much later than the Septuagint, and that's when you have a Hebrew quote in the Old Testament, it's usually from the Masoretic text. But the Septuagint is the most useful for our purposes because it predates the, the, the New Testament period by three centuries. Now in Daniel 9, it's also known as the interrupted prayer. There are three important pra primary prayers in the historical books of the Old Testament. Ezra 9, Nehemiah 9, and Daniel 9. It happens to be 9 in all three, which is not any significance, I think, it just will help to remember it. But we're going to look at the first 19 verses of this chapter are Daniel's prayer. And then Gabriel interrupts his prayer. And, uh, when, and he gives Daniel the most astonishing four verses in the entire Bible. That's why we're here. The so-called 70-week prophecy, verses 24 to the end. 24, 25, 26, 27. But let's start with a prayer. Most people jump right into the four verses. We're going to take, we're going to, this is too important to, to be cut corners. Let's jump in and get the context here. Daniel chapter 9, verse 1. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, and he goes on. Now, these are titles. Some people believe that Darius was the uncle of Cyrus, but that's conjecture by some of the scholars. He was made, it says, uh, um, he was made king, implies a passive recipient in some kind, so that leads to other scholastic sp speculations. But uh, the important part of this is setting aside the, the successions in the Persian Empire. It's verse 2. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years where, whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So Daniel, this whole thing starts because Daniel was reading his Bible. And he was reading in the, specifically in the book of Jeremiah. Now the first thing that will leap out at you if you're a student of the Bible is that Daniel took Jeremiah literally. When Jeremiah talks about 70 years captivity, it wasn't allegorical. It wasn't about, approximate. Daniel assumes it's precise. In fact, he knows it's about over. And we'll he does something very interesting. You know, if... Somebody told you, if you read in the Bible and you somehow discovered that the Lord is coming back to the earth three weeks from now, what would you do? Put your feet on desk and say, good, sooner the better. That's not what Daniel would do. What would Daniel do? Pray. Pray. Right on. You got it. He's an example to us all. But he knew 70 years was prophesied in Jeremiah, and he knew apparently about 67 had gone by. 
So he knew the 70 were about up, so he's getting excited here. But I want you to notice carefully what he did. Let's, read, let's first of all read Jeremiah. It occurs in two places. Jeremiah 25, verse 11 and 12, reads as follows. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. And it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans, and I will make it perpetual desolations. So that's a commitment that, he, that God gives in, Daniel, in uh, Jeremiah 25. In Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29, this is also a reference here. For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. This was written in Jerusalem. So there, twice in the book of Jeremiah, we have this promise that Daniel could cling to, that the captivity was about over. So what does Daniel do? Let's take a lesson here. He says, I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. So there's a couple of questions here. Um, are we supposed to pray for the second coming of Christ? It's inevitable, isn't it? We know the second, the second coming is going to happen sometime, right? But what does the Lord put in the Lord's prayer, as we call it? Thy kingdom come. You see, prayer, it's not like as if God needed our prayer to do it. It's God's way of enlisting us in what he is doing. And that's part of what prayer is all about. Now, you can, I'll leave it to you. We can talk about fasting. Is it, pro, is it appropriate for New Testament Christians to fast? Well, that's an Old Testament allusion, really. Look in Matthew 9. Acts 13, 14, 1 Corinthians 7, 2 Corinthians 6, and 2 Corinthians 11. And you'll find allusions uh, to New Testament Christians fasting. So, and don't do that casually. You should do that knowledgeably, having done some homework in that area. But it is an appropriate procedure for believers today. Anyway, Daniel set my face, he said, I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications, with fasting, and sackcloth and ashes. He's serious about this. And I prayed unto the Lord my God, and I made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. Now notice he says, we have sinned. That's a strange thing for Daniel to say. He's one of two people in the Old Testament about which no evil is spoken of, beside Christ, of course. Joseph and Daniel are two characters that have no evil recorded of them. Doesn't mean they're sinless, don't mean they understand me. But he's, what's interesting here, Daniel is praying earnestly, not on his personal behalf alone for his people. He says, we have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled. Even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments, neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets, which spake in thy name to our kings and our princes and our fathers and to all the people of the land. And he continues, O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces, as at this day, to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to all Israel that are near and that are far off, through all the countries whither thou hast driven them, because of their trespass that they have trespassed against thee. O Lord, to us belongeth confusion of face, to our kings, to our princes, what's the, uh, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. To the Lord our God belong mercies and forgivenesses, though we have rebelled against him. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore, the curse is poured upon us, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. He's saying their national destiny is determined by their behavior. Were there some saved among them? Of course. But that doesn't alter their national de uh, destiny, which is a function of their national behavior. And from here in your notes, you can, put, you can annotate, say, 2 Chronicles 7.14, which I believe we can apply to America's predicament, although it's a different one altogether. That's verse 12. 
Daniel, and he hath confirmed his words which he spake against us and he against our judges that judged us by bringing upon us a great evil. For under the whole heaven hath not been done as hath been done upon Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil has come upon us, yet made we not our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. Therefore hath the Lord watched upon the evil and brought upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in all his works which he doeth, for we obeyed not his voice. Do you get the flavor of Daniel's attitude here? And now, O Lord God, thou hast brought thy people forth out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, and hast gotten thee renown as at this day. We have sinned, and we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city Jerusalem, thy holy mountain. Because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. All this has then been an acknowledgment of sin. The focus is Jerusalem and the people of God. Now I want you to notice what starts to happen and you'll be able to feel, I believe, Daniel tremble, even in the English translation. He continued, Now therefore, O God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications, and cause thy face to shine upon the sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. O my God, incline thy ear and hear. Open thine eyes. Behold our desolations and the city which is called by thy name. For we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousness, but for thy great mercies. You'll see the verbs start to pick up here as we go here. Verse 19, O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hearken and do. Defer not for thine own sake. O my God, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. Now he's not through, but he's interrupted. It fascinates me every time I read this, even in the English, you, the, the frequency of those verbs start picking up. You can almost feel him the intensity, the emotion, the trembling of Daniel. And then we get to the interruption because we're going to have now a few verses by Gabriel. And then, of course, the incredible gift that Gabriel gives Daniel. Verse 20, Daniel says, And while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplications, you notice he's shifted gears here from the prayer. Now he's narrating what happened, see, while I was yet speaking and praying. And confessing my sin in the sin of my people Israel. And presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of God. Yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel. The word there is ish. It can be man or servant. The man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. Let me get that last phrase. You know, it's interesting to see Daniel describe this. Now, obviously, Gabriel is one of the archangels. We only know of three that are named. Gabriel, Michael, and a guy by the name of Lucifer got in a big bunch of trouble because of his pride. Michael is always a warrior, captain of the Lord's host, fighting on behalf of God's people. Gabriel, you'll discover, every time he appears, and he appeared once before in chapter 8 or 7, 8, I guess it was, and uh, uh, he's always, throughout the Bible, Old and New Testament, he's always announcing to somebody something having to do with the Messiah. He's apparently the advanced man or the press agent or a communications specialist, if whatever you want to, we would call him in our jargon, for the Messiah. But I want you to know something else that's subtle. When did Gabriel touch him on the shoulder? At the time of the evening oblation. Was there any evening oblation? He's in Persia. As a, the, the, the temple is, a, is about 400 miles to the west, and in rubble, there is no temple. There is no evening oblation. That's an anachronism. That's out of date by virtually 70 years, right? Not in Daniel's mind, because Gabriel touched him about the time of the evening oblation. Do you see Daniel's mentality? As far as he's concerned, that's God's place, and it's the time that they're supposed to be having it if they had a temple. So as far as he's concerned, see, he's using a phrase here that I think is revealing of his heart. And he, that is Gabriel, informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. Imagine Daniel was thrilled. That's exciting. That's what he's seeking. 
At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. So we're going to get in the vision, but I want to, I want to, as we go here, I want to sensitize you to stylistic issues of the Bible as a package. You may recall um, God spoke in Genesis 18 about Abraham. Is not Abraham my friend? Should I not show him what I'm about to do? Jesus were the disciples. Previously you were my servants, now I call you my friends in the upper room. John 14, 15, 16, 17, right there. What was the, the merit badge of being a friend worth? God would reveal what he's going to do. In other words, the concept, because Abraham's my friend, he let him in what was coming, what was going to happen in Genesis 19 and following. To the disciples, Jesus, because you are now my friends, he tells them about a second coming and so forth, right? Take that, move the decimal point one over. Abraham is known as the friend of God in the Old Testament. Who is the beloved in the Old Testament? Daniel. The Old Testament. Daniel. Who is the beloved in the New Testament? Well, yes, but who is the beloved? John. Right on. How interesting, Daniel, because he's the beloved one, is the one that's treated to the apocalyptic insights. John, in the New Testament, is the beloved one, and he is granted the privilege of the apocalyptic inside the book of Revelation. Now, what I'm, what I'm trying to get across, these concepts, there's a consistency between the Old and the New Testament in, of relationship. If you're my friend, I'll let you into what's coming. If you're really beloved, boy, you are really got the inside track. You follow what I'm saying? Kind of interesting. I think, it's, I think, that's, I think that's real. But anyway, so we're now at verse 23. The next four verses are the real focus of our study. And we're going to take two of the four to, on this session. So we're going to now look at the 70 weeks. Those are verses 24 through 27 of Daniel 9. The, the Daniel verse 24 will give you the scope of the whole package. It's an introduction. We'll take it in a minute. It will be followed by verse 25, which is going to deal with 69 of the 70 weeks. And that passage, verse 25, I, I'm going to submit to you when you get into it, will be the most startling passage you'll find in the Bible from a prophetic point of view. You're going to discover verse 27 deals with the missing, the last one, the 70th week. One of the most important insights for you to satisfy yourself about is that verse 26, which occurs between 25 and 27, deals with events that are after the 69th week and before the 70th week. You and I would not naturally presume that all 70 weeks are contiguous, except for the fact here is an insertion that tells us there's something after the 69th before the 70th. So there's an interval. We know that interval had to be, well, you'll discover it, had to be at least 38 years. It's actually gone 2,000. We'll talk about that. But that interval is important for you to understand the structure of this passage. Let's jump in. The scope, verse 24. 70 Shabuim, seven, seventy sevens are determined upon thy people in the holy city. This is Jewish. Seventy sevens are determined upon Daniel, upon thy people. Who's Daniel's people? Specifically the Jews. And upon the holy city, the city of Jerusalem. Though in those seventy sevens will, will result in the consummation of six things to finish the transgression. To make an end of sins. Now I'm not going to take the time here to split the hairs. Have, have the, has the transgression been finished? Are sins completed? Not so you'd notice, right? Pick up any daily paper. To make reconciliation for iniquity. And to bring in everlasting righteousness. You might argue that reconciliation for iniquity has been accomplished on the cross. But what about the rest of this? And finish transgression, make an end of sins? Bring in everlasting righteousness? I don't think so. How, how, how much we yearn for that. To seal up or complete, conclude, vision and prophecy. And one last thing, to anoint the most holy place. Your Bible may say the most holy, but it is uh, a Kadesh Kadeshim. It's the holy of holies. 
to anoint the Holy of Holies. Apparently, it's going to ultimately need some very special anointing. Now, this the main point to draw from this is the scope of this prophecy is incredibly conclusive on the one hand and yet incomplete in terms of fulfillment on the other. Because when this happens, sin is over, there's an end of sins, etc., etc. You with me? On the other hand, it isn't complete yet. So the 70th week has not been finished yet, whatever else is true. You with me so far? Okay. Now, if I t how long is a week? See, you and I are only familiar with weeks of days. And we do that because of the ordination of the, of the seventh, the week, of the seventh day and so forth in, in Genesis 2. And even more importantly, people say, what about the Sabbath? The Sabbath was written by the finger of God in stone in Exodus 20, verse 11. So the Sabbath is the Sabbath. There's also a week of weeks. That may surprise you. There's a feast of weeks in Leviticus 23, verse 15 and 16. There's also a week of months. From Nizon to Tishri, or from Tishri to Nizon. Either way, it's a it's a it's a it's a week of months, if you will, and uh, 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 ordained in uh, Exodus 12 verse 2 and Leviticus 23 verse 24. And of course, the dominant factor is years. There were sabbatical years for the land, and this is emphasized in Leviticus 25, virtually the whole chapter. Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 15. In fact, when you look at 2 Chronicles 36, you'll discover the reason they were in captivity for 70 years is because God said, you owe me 70. For 490 years, they failed to keep Leviticus 25. They didn't honor the idea of a year off for the land. Six years you plow it, and the seventh you let it rest. And they didn't do that for... 490 years, God says, you owe me 70, and that is literally, in 2 Chronicles 36, at the end of that chapter, God explains why the Babylonian captivity was 70 years. So, so if I told you that I've got to leave this ministry, but I won't be back for a decade, when would you expect me? Ten years from now. But I didn't say years, did I? I said decades. So you take for granted my figure of speech there is in years, not days. Well, it's just likewise, in what we have here, the Shibuyim is a week, yes, but of years, not days. To you and I, that sounds strange, but not if you're Jewish, because they have, they're used to, first of all, especially the, the Sabbath for the land and so forth. So let's take a look at verse 25. Gabriel's talking to Daniel. He says, know therefore and understand. So this is not a cryptic hidden thing. This is something Daniel is expected to understand. Know therefore and understand that... From the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Mashiach Nagid, the Messiah the king, Messiah the ruler, shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troubled times. I want you to notice the 69 weeks are 7 plus 62. Scholars aren't quite sure why it was presented that way. One of the speculations is that it took seven weeks of years to get Jerusalem rebuilt. That's, that's the speculation. We're not sure exactly why. There's different scholars have different conjectures. But the main point is, this is a mathematical prophecy. From one event to another is a specific period of time. Gabriel is saying to Daniel, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem. Picture the context. Daniel is now an old man. He was deported as a teenager in the Babylonian captivity. He rose to power in the Babylonian uh, uh, situation. Cyrus conquers Babylon. He rises to power again in the Persian kingdom. We're virtually a prime minister kind of guy. He knows all this time. He's been absent from Babylon virtually all his life. He's, probably, he's in his 70s or 80s. He was keyboard as a teenager. Jerusalem is in rubble. It was destroyed 70 years ago. But he knows from prophecy reading Jeremiah that it's de destined to be rebuilt, obviously. That's the hope of the Jew. Gabriel tells Daniel, no, they ever understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem. Now, so that's a milestone. We'll talk about that. Unto the Messiah the King, wow, shall be 69 weeks of years, in effect. 7 plus 62. 7 plus 62, 69 weeks of years. 
Then the Holy Spirit adds a footnote here. The street shall be built again and the wall in troubled times. That's there for the Holy Spirit always anticipates every conceivable misunderstanding that might arise. Do you know that you cannot encounter a false cult or a false belief on the, any of the landscape that isn't anticipated specifically in the scripture? It's really amazing. But anyway, he's got this remark here. We'll come to that. So what this is saying, in effect, is it's a trigger and a target. The terminus ad quo, a scholar would say, that the, the, the beginning point is a commandment to restore Jerusalem, right? The terminus ad quem, the, the, the trigger, the, fi the final conclusion, the trigger is the front end, the back end is the Messiah, the king. Between those two events is 69 weeks of years, 69 times 7, which is about 483 years. You with me so far? Okay. And many your footnotes and many Bibles will highlight saying, gee, that's about right. I don't believe God uses approximate in his vocabulary. Okay, if he's there, if you peel it far enough, you'll discover he's incredibly precise. Now, let's talk about the decrees of Jerusalem. Your Bible, your, if you have a study Bible, it probably has a footnote saying there are three different decrees that you could use. Wrong, there are actually four. But uh, there, Cyrus did one in 537. That's recorded in Ezra chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Darius did one in, that's recorded in Ezra 6 and Ezra 8. And Artaxerxes... Uh, did two of them, one in 458 B.C. That's recorded in Ezra 7. Now you need a, <clears throat> I should explain, by the way, the book of Ezra versus the book of Nehemiah. Book of Ezra is the chronicle of Cyrus's freedom to go home and build their temple. And they struggle and they struggle and they struggle to build their temple. And that's what Ezra's all about. They don't get very far because they can't protect themselves. That's what sets the stage for Nehemiah. Because Nehemiah is the cupbearer to the big Gahuna in his day, Artaxerxes. He issues a decree in 458 that's useful. It's in Ezra 7. But the one that we're interested in is the fourth one, Artaxerxes, in 445 B.C. It's recorded in Nehemiah chapter 2, three different places. Why is that different? Because it's the only one of the four that deals with the city of Jerusalem. The other three are dealing with the temple. Right? Remember what the thing said? The street shall be built again and the wall. The word actually for wall is trench or moat. Okay. See, the, the word rechab is street and the word karutz is wall or moat in, in, uh, in, the, in verse uh, 25, uh, 25. So clearly of these decrees, it's the city, not the temple, that's the focus of Gabriel's trigger point. Therefore, the first three decrees are not the ones that should concern us because they deal with the temple. The whole point of Nehemiah's, the book of Nehemiah, is that Nehemiah, because of the relationship with the king, he was the cupbearer, that also means he was the taster. He was the one trusted by the king. But he, as a favor to him, he gave Nehemiah the authority to rebuild the city, put a wall around, have their own government. That was what was missing, to rebuild the city. The nation went into slavery at Babylon, was freed under Cyrus, they went home. The nation is no longer under servitude. But they can't build their city. They don't have the authority. Nehemiah gets the authority. And that's what Gabriel is talking to Daniel. When the decree, from the decree to rebuild, uh, restore Jerusalem unto the Mashiach Nagid. Okay. Well, it turns out that decree is documented. On our calendar, it was given by the, the decree of Artaxerxes Longimanus. It was given on March 14th of 445 B.C. And we're indebted, this whole presentation is indebted to Sir Robert Anderson, head of Scotland Yard, was knighted, and he published a landmark study in 1894 that tracked down a lot of these details. It was a book out of print. It was a rare book when I was a teenager, but a friend of mine happened to have a copy and treated me as a gift to Sir Robert Anderson's coming prints. And, I, and I, 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 that's where I first, that, this is the, the, the insight I had already accepted Christ. I was a Christian in my teens. But it was this insight that galvanized me to realize you can prove that Jesus Christ is who he said he is by this very passage. It's astonishing. Now, that book used to be a rare book when I first got my first copy. But it's become very popular. You can pick it up in any good Christian bookstore. The Coming Prince by Sir Robert Anderson. 
It used to be a rare book. Today, it's quite readily available. It has all the footnotes and background of how he went, how he done, he nailed down this the precision we're going to deal with here. But in any case, the the, the trigger point, the terminus ad quo, is the decree of Artaxerxes Longimanus in March 1445 B.C. Great, no problem. Now the other question is, what about these years? What kind of years are we talking about? They're lunar years, solar years, sidereal years, and you know, what, what are we talking about here? The Bible always deals in 360-day years, and Sir Robert Anderson noted that, and that started le led to the unraveling of this. Why are we talking 360-day years? In the book of Genesis, you'll discover Genesis 7 and 8, the, the, year, the year there it consists of 12 30-day months, whether you like it or not. Sounds very peculiar. Book of Daniel, of course, deals with it. Book of Revelation also does. So from Genesis to Revelation, you'll discover that for certain purposes, at least, we're dealing in 360-day years. As we investigate this further, it's very puzzling because you'll discover that all the ancient calendars, the Assyrians, the Chaldeans, the Egyptians, obviously the Hebrews, the Persians, the Greeks, the Phoenicians, the Chinese, the Mayans, Hindus, Carthaginians, the Etruscans, the Teutons, all at one time had calendars based on 360-day calendars, usually 12, 30-day months, but sometimes slight variations. But they're all, they were all at one time, the ancient ones, but then they all change about 701 B.C. And we'll get back to that. Now, we get into this in great detail in, when we explore the long day of Joshua in, uh, uh, when we, uh, in Joshua chapter 10, verse, 10 uh, verse 12 and 13. It deals with this strange issue. And there is a conjecture just a conjecture by some scientists that Mars and the Earth were on resonant orbits in ancient times that had near passbys that transferred energy. And uh, they had a, the Earth had an a, a orbit of 360 days, and Mars had 720. And they were in resonance, just like a tuning fork. If you, or, uh, they've discovered a thing with, in the modern space age, a thing called orbital resonance. But they would always, the orbits would cross. And, and, and every 104 years, there'd be a near pass by between Mars and Earth. And uh, there were resonant orbits. Uh, and uh, the, uh, in the, the, the one pass if, in the spring, there'd always be March 20th, 21st. That's if um, uh, uh, Mars passes from the inside uh, near the Earth. If it moves ahead, it loses energy. Earth it gains some, Mars loses a little energy. So the orbits would alter a little bit. And then other times they would be a near pass by in the fall. It would always occur about October 25th. And if it came from the outside then, from aphelion, that's the furthest from the sun, and it would uh, pass behind the Earth, and the Earth would lose energy, Mars would pick up. So there's, there's some exchange of energies all the way through here. This has all been computer modeled, by the way, in some fascinating in in indications. And uh, uh, so it led to the, in 701 BC, the energy transfer is finally stabilized. So in 701 BC, they stayed stable. But by then, the Earth had 365 and a quarter days. They picked up five and a quarter days. Mars lost a few from 720 down to 687. So they changed their, they stabilized in 701. You say that sounds cute conjecture. It turns out it is strangely confirmed by Jonathan Swift's fictional story about Gulliver's Travels. Now, just fiction, but he was a, he was a, set to, he was a Irish poet that was a, a, a satirist. He was making fun of the politics in London with the stories. And uh, we all know Lillip, the, 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 Gull, Gulliver's Voyage to Lilliput, the place of the little people. That's the one that's popular among the kids. It's now just looked at as children's stories, of course, because we've lost the political context of the time. But the point is, the third voyage of Gulliver, Gulliver visits this island where the astronomers, among other things, brag that they know about the two moons of Mars. He talks about their orbits and their rotation. What makes that bizarre is that Jonathan Swift published his Gulliver's Travels 151 years before the astronomical world discovered there were two moons of Mars. And so did that mean that he really knew that? No, he just he, he took what he, was some legend he had and to embellish his stories, not realizing that those legends were eyewitness accounts because telescopes had not been invented that could resolve the, the uh, two moons of Mars. One is only eight miles across. It's almost black. It has an albedo or reflectivity of only 3%. So they're hard to see even with a good telescope. The telescope technology, it wasn't until uh, Asaph Hall with the new telescope at the U.S. Naval Observatory made history by discovering the two moons of Mars 151 years after Jonathan Swift's. So strange enough, this demonstrates one of the many evidences that Mars used to pass near the Earth enough to disrupt things on the planet Earth. That's why the ancient P 
peoples were terrified of Mars. That's why he has the name Mars, God of War. That's why we have martial arts. There's a whole, they were terrified. There's a whole thing uh, uh, we'll spare. Anyway, the point is we have evidence that the 360 days. Now, in 71 BC, the Romans added five and a quarter days. Hezekiah added a month to the Jewish calendar on a cycle of seven different times in a 19-year cycle. And the rabbis speculate, why did Hezekiah pick that particular way of accommodating the adjustments? And um, they don't explain what's even more interesting. Why did he have to change it at all? Why did, you know, that, that's a bigger question. Well, because there were, co there were cosmological changes, apparently. But in any case, we're still using 360 days here, which means that if you take 69 weeks of 368 years, what Gabriel is telling Daniel, in effect, is that from the commandment to restore Jerusalem, Unto the Messiah the King shall be 173,880 days. Well, we know the decree of Artaxerxes Langemanus uh, <clears throat> was the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. When did Jesus permit himself to be worshipped as a king? The Mashiach Nagid. The word Nagid is first used of Saul. It means ruler, captain, of, uh, or top guy. And uh, so... When did Jesus allow that to happen? And uh, it, uh, many times in your New Testament, you may recall, there were a couple occasions where the, and the, <coughs> pardon me, the enthusiasm of the crowd tried to take him as a king, and he slipped away. He wouldn't let it happen. Mine hour is not yet come. We find that in John 6, 7, several places. And uh, then one day, Jesus does something weird. He not only permits it, he arranges it. He deliberately sets things up to fulfill a prophecy of Zechariah. In Zechariah 9, verse 9, there's a prophecy. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king, key word, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just in having salvation, lowly, riding upon an ass, in fact, upon the colt, the foal of an ass. So Jesus deliberately tells his disciples to go to a certain place, Give them a password, they'll release the donkey, bring it here, and he rides this donkey into Jerusalem, deliberately fulfilling this. Thy king cometh unto thee. He is presenting himself as a king to Jerusalem. Now, how many have heard the, the, um, the Bible verse, this is the day which the Lord hath made, we shall rejoice and be glad in it? How many have heard that? How many have applied that to every day? We can. We can rejoice that this is the day the Lord has made. But that psalm is Psalm 118. It's actually celebrating a specific day in history. Rejoice, this is the day the Lord hath made. What does it mean by that? Because in Psalm 118, it says, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now you'll notice in Luke 19, which is one of the New Testament records of what we call the triumphal entry, Jesus is riding this donkey... And they're throwing down the palm branches. And when they run out of palm branches, they throw down their coats and so forth. You all know the story, right? And they are singing Psalm 118. And only a part, they don't quote the whole psalm but, but, uh, in Luke, but he quotes part of it. Saying, blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven. And you and I, as Gentiles, listening to this, say, wow, that's pretty neat. We miss the point. And whenever we run the risk of missing the point, the Pharisees come to our rescue. Every time they're upset, there's a reason they're upset, and it will be an insight that we as Gentiles might lack, because they become unglued. In Luke 19, verse 39, some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said to him, Master, rebuke your disciples. Why? What for? They're singing a song. It's, it's a psalm. Yes, but see, the Pharisees understand that singing that psalm under these circumstances were declaring him the Messiah. Thy king cometh unto thee. He is riding the donkey like Zechariah 9.9. They're singing Psalm 118. The Pharisees naturally assume he, this, that the master doesn't want his disciples blaspheming. They're blaspheming. They're calling him the son of God. They're calling him the Messiah. I want you to notice his tactful reply. Jesus answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. 
And of course, whenever we're in Israel on a tour, we always get, take some pictures up at the top of Mount of Olives. It's a great overlook of the old city. And the, the next stop is usually Gethsemane, down at the base of the Mount of Olives. And, what we do, and the buses will meet us down there, but we usually walk down the road, the very road that he rode here. Because you come to the top of Mount of Olives, you go down this road, right down to Gethsemane. And I usually explain while everybody's taking their pictures, is when you're going down this road, there's the best bargain in Israel. Reach down and pick a rock or two. There's lots of rocks around. Pick a rock or two and put it in your pocket. It's free. It's the best bargain in Israel. It's free. And uh, you know how to take a, uh, a small fortune out of Israel? Bring a large fortune in. See? <laughs> but you take these rocks, and when you do, when you get home, you have them mounted on a piece of walnut for your, uh, or mahogany or whatever, for your office or your coffee table or your den or whatever, and just mount it there like a trophy. When somebody says, gee, what's that? Glad you asked. You can tell them all about Daniel 9 and Luke 19. And they brought it up. See, it's a great, great thing. <laughs> and so, so these are one of the, you just tell them that's one of the stones that didn't cry out, see. And so, so let's talk a little bit about the chronology of Christ's ministry. We know that Christ's ministry began in the fall of 28 AD. How do we know that? Tiberius was appointed in 14 AD. Augustus died in August 19th of 14 AD, and we know that his ministry began within the 15th year of Tiberius, which means that it's got 14 plus 14. The 15th year hasn't gone by. It's in the 15th year. It's like the trick I just played on our friend here when he's on his 50th birthday, saying he's entered our 10th decade. Uh, excuse me, he's entered our 6th decade. Well, I'm cheating. See, the 15th year of Tiberius means it's year 14. He's in the 15th year. You follow me? So it's 14 plus 14 or 28 AD that we're talking about. The, the, that means the fourth Passover in Jesus' ministry would have been on April 6th of 32 AD. And this is all detailed for you if you want to do the research in Sir Robert Anderson's book, published in 1894. Now, you will find other people that try to support a different chronology and you won't, you'll wonder, what's the problem here? And part of the problem is they're trying to defend a Friday crucifixion. Because th April 6, 32 AD, the, uh, the uh, Passover was not on a Friday. I believe it's on a Wednesday. And so people who are trying to defend a Friday crucifixion assume it couldn't be 32 AD. Follow me? So that's part of the, that's what lingers. By. I used to be troubled because as I'd study and run into all these other views that had all their arguments and stuff, and they never quite computed. And I began to realize what, that what they're trying to do is defend, they, they start from the presumption that the crucifixion occurred on a Friday, which you can disprove by three different pro, uh, passages in the New Testament. But let's uh, just stay with it. So we have now something kind of interesting. The commandment restored to build Jerusalem is the decree of Artaxerxes Longimanus on March 14th of 445 BC. The triumphal, triumphal entry occurred on April 6th, 32 AD. Now recognize something else here that uh, to put you on the, the Septuagint translation that we're drawing this from was translated into Greek, you know, less than halfway through this period, okay? In other words, 300 years earlier, this prophecy, the things we're reading were translated into Greek. So no one can mucky around with this after the fact. Are you with me? Let's take a look at this. March 445 B.C. to 32 A.D. Turns out, if you multiply that out in, 300, in, uh, in our calendar, it's 173,740 days. From March 14th to April 6th is another 24 days, and when you go through the leap year calculations, it's another 116 days. And, and all that's detailed for you in Sir Robert Anderson's book, if you're interested in you know, unraveling that. But the net of it is, it turns out, the, the number of days between the decree of Artaxerxes Longimanus on March 14th of 445 B.C. and the triumphal entry on April 6th of 32 A.D. is 173,880 days. What was Gabriel's margin of error? Zero. Gabriel told Daniel the precise day that the Messiah would present himself as a king to Jerusalem. And he did. How did Jesus arrange that, to have that in the book of Daniel, etc.? We're not through. As you look at Luke 19, as he came near, he's, he started at Bethany, rode the donkey up over the Mount of Olives, coming down the Kidron Valley, heading into the old city. 
When he was come near, he beheld the city, and what did he do? He wept over it. This is a triumphal entry. This is the big day. But he wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, get this, at least in this thy day, the things which belong to thy peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. He said, you had your chance. He expected them to understand that he was the Messiah on schedule, as Gabriel had predicted. If thou at least in this thy day, if you had known the things which belong to thy peace, but now they are hid from their eyes. He, he, he announces judicial blindness here. Israel is blinded forever, no. Paul tells us in Romans 11.25, Israel is blinded until the fullness of the Gentiles come in, the completion of the church. This thy day, but now they are hidden from thine eyes. Sobering passage. Gets worse. Next verse he says, For the day shall come upon thee, that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another. And indeed, 38 years from the time he said that, Titus Vespasian and the 5th, 10th, 12th, and 15th legions laid siege for about nine months and slaughtered over a million inhabitants, men, women, and children. And another half a million died from the famines and, and pestilence following. Big event in Jewish history, the fall of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. Question, key question, why did Jerusalem fall in 70 A.D.? Lots of good answers to that. Let's look at what Jesus said was the answer. Let's read the rest of verse 44. Because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. You know, that's chilling to me. Because as I read this and try to digest what's going on here, I realize Jesus held them accountable to no prophecy. They may not have known the exact day, but they should have recognized the situation. And because they didn't, Jerusalem was destroyed. What does that do for us? How much more do we know today than they did then about Scripture and fulfillment and so forth? There's a responsibility that goes along with all this. Thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Those are heavy words. Now in the next session, we're going to talk about the next two verses. The interval between the 69th and the 70th. And we'll also, of course, talk about the 70th week, which is the key to end time prophecy. But before we even go down the prophecy road, what we've talked about so far, verse 25, as you understand it, as you come to terms with it, is the most astonishing demonstration of the deity of Jesus Christ. His fulfillment of the, those details are absolutely beyond rationalizing by the skeptics. The convolutions and the allegorizations and the squirming and wiggling they have to try to do to get out from under the evidence, the hard, specific evidence of that verse, where it is, and the fulfillment of history, where it happened is breathtaking. And uh, we often go through how sure can we be and we go through eight prophecies and all that business. This one prophecy eclipses all the rest put together in terms of the unlikelihood that this was accidental or coincidence or happenstance. No, it is God's precision is awesome. And one of the things you need to, there's lessons here too, not just about prophecy but about God's uh, hermeneutics. To understand God means what he says and says what he means. He's precise. He has a precision that's astonishing. Sometimes that precision hides behind the original Hebrew in subtleties that we, we may lose in our English translation. But God in the original is uh, every, every place name, every number, every detail is there by skillful design, careful design, caring design on our behalf. By the next session... We'll talk a look now, okay, given all that, where are we in this prophecy and where are we headed? And that is astonishingly clearly laid out. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer.
Father, we just thank you for who you are. And we stand in awe, not only as we survey the heavens or as we take a glimpse in a microscope, but as we encounter your word. We're astonished at how far you've gone to be precise and to be beyond, beyond questioning. We just stagger. And yet, Father, we ask you through your Holy Spirit to guide us, lead us, illuminate your word that we might glean from it that which you would have us take into our own lives. We do ask you, Father, that you would help us each to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, and that you would help each of us be more effective in understanding what you would have of us in the days ahead as we commit ourselves into your hands. In the names of the Mashiach Nagid, Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.